and three, two, one, we are live. Hello everyone, my name is Oleg and I'm very happy to see you here in my virtual studio here. We have an excellent guest today. Uh, please welcome Ishel. Ishel, how are you doing? Fantastic. It's a really nice day today here in Basel. So good afternoon. Noon for me is 7 p.m. I think it's almost the same for you, isn't it, Oleg? Yeah, it's a little bit afternoon at 8 p.m. The time zone changes last couple of weeks were tough, but we managed, we succeeded, and now I think like for half a year we are safe. Yes. Uh, if anyone is watching who is not, who doesn't know Ishel uh, very well, Ishel is a software developer, a Java champion, uh, a super frog. I think you are currently working for JFrog. Yes, uh, yes, yes. Yes, and she's she's a great expert. And today we wanted to have a little chat, a little discussion about uh, some tools and libraries in the Java ecosystem that focus on testing. So testing libraries, some testing tools. And who better than the shell to, to introduce some of this for us? And I think it would be a very, very interesting session. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to just uh, post the comments in chat and we're gonna have an interactive uh, sort of interactive Conversation. Yes, I, yeah. I, I love to, to, to hear what other people connecting is using. And I will tell you a little bit about my story so you understand why testing is so important to me. So that, that'd, be, that'd be lovely. Right. The stage is yours. Uh, thank you. And take us through the story. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you, Ole. Well, as Oleg said, I'm a Java developer. In my last years, I was a full stack developer. So I dwelled into front end and back end. But at the end, I'm a back end developer most of the time. And uh, recently, I made the transition to DevOps. And But I like to think that I have been working in this kind of environment for far longer than my just uh, job change. And this is because I have a very strong Linux background since, since I, I graduated from school. So as a consultant, um, when you go to different customers and see different projects, you are, well, you are the expert, first of all. So you're there to solve problems and to solve them problems like long lasting, and at the same time, leaving something that is easily maintainable, manageable, and it actually solves the problem. So now my last customers uh, during COVID and everything like that, what it was, it, it was a trend. Like we have to move faster, react faster, deliver features faster, reduce our problems. It went from something good to have to a must. I, we had to, the, my, my last customer, it was um, selling, well, his main product was security transfer, security transfer of documents. So imagine that day we started and everything was working from home. So the amount of information that from one day to another we have to manage was insane the number of new customers that my client had increased really, really fast. So thankfully for us, uh, we they, they were already in this wagon of DevOps. So we have all this agile um, methodology to develop software. And this is exactly what I, I like to tell people. I, Nowadays, we as a software developers, we don't have an issue about finding jobs uh, because every single industry, depend, independent of what they are doing, they are doing software or they are consuming software in-house or in, uh, well, in premise or in the cloud or not. So I'm going to share you the, 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 the slides because I usually like to have this kind of slides and even for this kind of a very informal conversation where I really, really want to hear what, what the audience is talking about and if this actually makes sense for them. So this is me, yes, usually this is my presentation during any any 
conference. And from Mexico, I live in Switzerland. Um, I'm a Java champion. And I work for Yayfrog. And that photo represents exactly what I, what I like to do because that is a conference. Actually, that's an unconference, JGrid. So that is what I like to do. Go around the world, sometimes virtually, to share the knowledge. So why did this particular session or this idea of presenting uh, today, this, this tools happens? It's as I said, building software, it is an interactive process. And we need to be delivering our, our software quite repeatedly. And I'm not going to say that we want to deliver fast, but we want to deliver in a cadence that it's in accordance to what our product is selling. For example, if we are trying A-B testing, this has to happen like thousands of times per week or per day. It depends what we're trying to do. And fortunately, there are several things that help us uh, realize these goals and try to avoid that exactly, either when we are developing or when we are releasing. And one of the things that I really like to think is that whenever we release a new version, we are improving. So as software developers, we have, and I think this is me, um, we have our main objective or our main activity is we are writing code. At the end of the day, uh, there are AI programs that write code, but most of the code that is written right now, it's by, it's by human, humans. The other important key is it's going to be consumed by humans. Even it's going to be executed by a machine, uh, chances are that we as the developers, we're going to be reading other people's code. And the ultimate goal of writing software is to improve human lives. That should be like the most important things. Why, why we as a software developers are creating a um, sales ticket system, or we are managing trains, or we are managing our, our taxes or banking solutions, security solutions. So the whole purpose is to improve human life. And our improvement, not only in the big picture, is that every single release should be an improvement on the last one. So we shouldn't introduce um, more problems. We should introduce quality sometimes or improve the more quality in our software. And also maybe, and I'm saying maybe, introduce new features. And sometimes these two goals are not so easy to manage together, but this is in like abstract terms, what we are trying to do or we should be aiming to do. And as I said, to, to, the, to reduce the friction of, of doing this, there are several concepts that since the last 10 years, so if you, um, at this point, even, even the most um, secluded developers already have been bombarded by these keywords like DevOps, DevSecOps, Shift Left, and Agile. So the first one is DevOps introduced, introduced something that some developers didn't like because we or they were saying, like, uh, we already take care of the code, we take care of everything, so why we should be concerned with the running part? So why are we bringing responsibilities from the ops teams into our domain? Uh, because at the end, when we were um, only developers, only developers, we, we generated our artifacts and we sent them to ops and said, well, it's your turn, you deploy it as you wish, where you wish, and how you wish. And if you have a problem, well, um, create a ticket, please. And I will see it next time. So DevOps culture make us developers have, if not all the knowledge of ops, at least most or an idea, a more clear picture of what ops are doing. And what is more interesting is because they are giving us that accountability. If you build it, you should be concerned with how we're going to deploy it, even if you don't have the credentials. Because at the end of the day, again, uh, ops is not going to give us the real environments. But we have to have an idea. 
DevSecOps, which is the next keyword that we've been hearing, this is more about introducing security, like the middle keyword, and what they are providing or pushing forwards to us as developers is to use more um, solutions or more applications or, or introduce more assessments into this conversation. For example, a static code analysis uh, of our dependencies, uh, the composition check that our software components are, what it, we, how they should be. Like, this is integration testing, but in, an, in another level. I'm going to talk about the integration testing, and that's why this talk is super important to me. And then the dynamic application security testing, so the outside-in approach. We see everything as a black box. Then uh, other, we are continuously assess, assessing what is happening between our services and scanning the container images that sometimes we depend on or we build a different layer of our services uh, on some of these container images that are already existing. And because right now there's another buzzword that is more about like the architectural style microservices or small services or I don't want to go into the discussion what is a microservice, what is the right size of a microservice, or if we should go into function or not. And finally, if you are in microservices or a cloud native um, architecture, well, you also need to keep in mind and check the configuration of all your cloud infrastructure. And finally, <laughs> something that you should be hearing a lot, shift left. Shift left, it's only bringing testing and security even more early into the entire development um, software development cycle. So again, as you can see, in the last five to seven years, we are saying to the developers, testing and security has to happen before this is a first class citizens um, for you it shouldn't happen as an afterthought we shouldn't have a QA communication and after we, we brought bring you all the changes that we found no you should think about this in the first place so the challenges are a lot but one of the challenges and the areas of opportunity that I see always is testing. If we introduce our testing earlier, uh, we can detect and close the loops of feedbacks in our software development process. And there are several different types of testing. I mean, we have unit integration, um, UI end-to-end, end-to-end contract testing, et cetera, et cetera. So what I'm going to talk about here is integration testing and some of the contract testing. And again, um, most of this is really important for whatever architectural style you're using to develop applications. But when we're talking about microservices, this is hugely more important. So we're talking about the Java ecosystem because obviously microservices, one of the promise of microservices is that you can have your services develop in different languages and have their own uh, cycle, software development cycle. So as I said, that is actually increasing the complexity because you have more fragmented pieces, each one having a different cycle and potentially in different languages, but trying to impose the same governance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But if we are using Java to develop our monoliths, uh, small services, microservices, or whatever we want to call them, um, I like to I like to redirect uh, people's attention to very, very important tools. And one of the ways that I like um, to show or to, in, to, to explain this is it doesn't matter if it's just a service or a collection of services. There's 
a way to check uh, how they are behaving. So this is exactly what I want. I want to show and I want to rely on very solid but agnostic tools. So this are going to be, and this has been my, my personal favorite for, for several years. And people who have seen my war mock uh, talk is they are always they always remark like Shelly, you speak so fast and I speak so fast with, when I'm talking about the war mocks because I want to um, show them as much of the functionality that made me fall in love with this particular tool and and I sh I go into so many examples so. Um, I, I totally recommend it, not only my session, but there are super nice, like advanced wire mock sessions, and you will be very, very um, happy to, to watch that. So what a mock is a simulator. Some people say that it's a serv service virtualiz virtualization tool, others and mock servers. And one of the things that people usually don't know or they, they don't see the potential is that it can start as a standalone process. So you can record and play back. Uh, you can start it by using it as a proxy. And one of the things that I particularly like a lot about Wormock is that it's so easy to create your different uh, cases, for example, simulating faults or stateful behaviors. So let me tell you a little bit about Wormock. The latest uh, release, it was in December last year. And now they, 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 then the last release, what they were able to do, let me, let me, uh, they were they were out, um, able to in, introduce in the, in the version 232.0 the ability to run Wormock without needing the HTTP server. So they actually are closer to to use a totally um, deployment model in serverless. That was already um, able to do it with Wormock app, but the problem is that if you are using Wormock app, it's relying on the internal APIs. And whenever they move to Java modules, it's going to break. So after, and I strongly su suggest you, if you're already using Wormock to upgrade to the latest version, as I said, it already su supports a serverless deployment model. And this is more um, sustainable if you are still using it or you want to use it in serverless mode. So. I'm going to show you at the end the demo. So I'm not going to um, go into the why I fell in love with it and with the examples right now. But believe me, um, it's one of my favorite tools. The other one is rest assured. Um, I'm not putting the names. It's actually that is the URL of where you can find the projects. So. When we were talking about microservices, and one of our uh, favorite um, formats for communication between them is JSON. And JSON has many issues. <laughs> and there are better ways to communicate between different components and services. Uh, but it's one of the most common ones. I mean, it's it seems like every team says this is the most common one, this is human readable. It doesn't matter that we cannot check the format or we are actually not sending the actual types, but it doesn't matter. So there is honestly um, thousands of APIs, public APIs out there that are in, in JSON or XML. So one of the things that really, really makes your life easier is to use uh, tools that help you to write tests for consuming uh, JSON. And this is one of my favorites. Um, there are several reasons why I really like it. And one of the reasons is that parsing um, 
X, uh, XML or JSON with Groovy and Ruby is super easy comparing to, to Java. I mean, you reduce a lot of the ceremony. And with rest assured, you have the same feeling, actually it's using it, but the same feeling even for content matching or creating your asset asserts supports authentication and actually Spring Boot, there is a really good integration with Spring Boot. It's at your, choose, uh, your um, choice for services or microservices. The last release is 451. It was in February 11, 2021. And what is was remarkable of the last two versions of that, they upgraded to version 3.0 now from group for Groovy. So that's interesting. Mm, my third favorite um, tool. Yes, I know, I know. And, and let me, yeah, yeah, yeah. And let me tell you that I started talking about test containers years ago. And at that time, the reason was easy. Um, we were already working with uh, a product. And it was always it was almost a finished product, but when we when my company where I was com working at that time decided to sell it as a box product, and we changed market, we totally changed market, and suddenly the model was not a valid one, and it was completely different. So we abused it the some parts of the dynamic model, so. At some point, we were um, doing migrations of our database schemas, and they were very risky because we were almost in the final testing phase with a lot of our clients, and we knew that we were misusing our schemas in some way, and they had new requirements on our business models. So we were in a chaotic moment in, in development. And this, this introduced some technical channel challenges that is not, you don't find them in a book. Like if you find this problem, you solve it like that. And at that point, we realized that we couldn't test with migrating schemas with H2. And at that time we had customers that use Postgres, customers that use MySQL, and customers that use Oracle. And one of our customers, thankfully just one, was misusing the application. So one of our tests required us to download an almost, almost production type database it was not, but at least gave us an idea how they were misusing our business model. And when we upgraded the schema, we could run some tests on sanity checks on our new schemas just to see that if the data that we migrated was correct. Checking that the schema, the migration schema was correct, it is easy. There are several tools out there to check exactly that, to have even the versioning. Flyway, Liquibase, they are mm, for that. But our particular use case was checking the sanity of our data-like um, production. It was correct even after this migration of the schema when we did horrible things with that. So enter test containers. At that time, we were using the plugin from Gradle to use Docker Compose because we said, of course, we can do this. We can spin a Docker container with Postgres and uh, we dumped the data. We run our migrations. We verified that the schema was migrated correctly and we do our sanity checks on the data and see that everything is okay. Um, First problem, and actually the idea was, was quite nice. I mean, at the end of the day, we were going to get with a green light or red light. This migration of our use schema actually mess up your data beyond recognition or go ahead, you have better chances to succeed in this. 
What was the problem with us in that Gradle plugin for Docker Compose? And well, first of all, that if the test failed, <laughs> we have plenty of zombie containers. Like, yes. Do you want to run your test in parallel? No, can do. Why? Because you have port conflict. You have, you, you cannot. I mean, in the same agent, you cannot because we were using Docker Compose and we have to fix some of this. So when we discover at that time, and I'm saying several years, test containers, we saw that there was no port conflict because they were random, they were self-contained. So everything like the, um, and we it didn't even need to, to say uh, what the name, of, the name of the database, the user, the password, nothing. Everything was given inside or in a more seamless way with uh, test containers. And then that's when I discovered about Ryuk and, um, and the certainty that you had that you will not receive any call from op operations telling you that you're killing your CI agents because suddenly you have like tens of Docker containers in a zombie state or you actually kill the machines. So there were so many um, really good reasons to do it. And the other one, but it was less dramatic for us, is was, um, as I said, we had different databases. And at the beginning for, for um, theoretically reduce the number of tests or make them run faster, we were using H2 with uh, SQL that it was supposedly to be a standard SQL. We discovered that it was not, some of them were not so standard in the worst possible way, too late. So what we learned at that time, it was like test as close as production as possible. So later on, we didn't even, um, rely ever in H2. We were using exactly what we were supposed to be using with even different versions of the database that we officially supported for our product. So for several reasons, um, we fell in love with test containers. And again, one of the most, when, when test containers really shine for me is for databases. But actually, you can run anything um, that you want on a Docker Compose. And I have some examples in, in, in different um, sessions where I do crazy, really crazy stuff. Like, for example, creating our my servers, mocking my servers with my wire mock, and then running my wire mock inside a container and using it like um, a fake server inside my test. So really, really crazy stuff, but it's it's because you can run whatever it's containerized with test containers. And as I said, it really shines when you are using databases and they have support for different modules. So what is important about this is that not all the databases behave the same way. Not all the databases take this time, the same time to initialize. Not all the databases initialize the script in the same way. So what, what you guys, and thank you very much for that, is been working on trying to standardize uh, how to deal with them, like within its script, um, or you actually do know how, what, what it's supposed to be a good health check to decide if the database is ready to receive any statement from, from the test or not. And uh, the other thing is, as I said, it's not only databases, but there are several things. And one of the things that my, uh, my teammates really appreciated was the web driver containers because we can create our um, tests with browsers inside of them, like Firefox, Edge, and Chrome. It was it was uh, supported, and it actually supports the BNC's um, screen recording. So, if for for whatever reason they fail, you can take pictures, video, or something. 
of the entire running of the tests or just the ones that fail. And for example, for the Elasticsearch container, and this is the important part that I was mentioning, that you have taken care of like in, its, in a certain way, reduced or smooth all the different details. Uh, for example, uh, in, in the um, elastic in Elasticsearch module, it comes with the bas basic license that contains like, you should provide your password. So this is already like things you don't have to think if you are starting your, your container from zero. And well, you know, you did the release 163 this January. And what I caught my eye in this particular release was that you uh, created the support for KS3 lightweight Kubernetes. So that's actually super nice. Because again, remember this, um, I, I keep talking about this these tools because the new um, serverless era in our case, microservices in the Java world um, require that we move into the cloud native um, um, world. So having our tools that actually are still supporting or helping us develop this kind of application is really important for us, at least for me. And that's why I'm also going to talk to you about a JMeter. I know, I know, JMeter was out even before I started working in, in, in as a developer. So I'm talking about a very, 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 very mature uh, tool. But what I love about JMeter and what actually saved my life at some point, my professional life, was that it allows you to use scriptable samples. For example, all the languages compatible with JSR 223. And by this point, you probably know that I'm a Groovy enthusiast. So this is what actually I love about JMeter. And I also had a, a very interesting um, use case. For example, there I, I already talked about a wire mock and several other tools that allow you um, record and replay. But what happens if in our case, in our case, we were doing some services with REST APIs, et cetera, et cetera. And we couldn't do record and replay or playback uh, as easily because we were having a, uh, a very a custom header. And that custom header behaved in, uh, it, it, it was kind of a security, kind of an ID identification that it followed a logic. I mean, we, we knew what was the logic uh, behind it and we could uh, in certain way calculate it and concatenate it and actually create what the behavior was needed or expected. So by having this possibility in JMeter, we were able to change or create our test plans with this um, capabilities. So our distributed testing, which JMeter excels, so uh, with this supporting JSR 223, Groovy in this case, for creating this custom headers, was actually the light server, lightsaber. So that's exactly why I still have a very, very soft spot for JMeter because that particular functionality is so different, so difficult, almost impossible in some cases to get it with the actual tools out there. And they are in version 5.4.3. And the only reason why they updated to this version was because they changed the dependency that log for j from 2.16.0 to 2.17.0. And well, I'm not going to touch that topic. <laughs> um, the entire log for j problem. Well, that was the actually only the, the theory. Let's go back to a little bit more of the information that I want to show you the examples and the code and examples and code from other people and examples that I have created for you. So let me share now my screen. So is there any question, something you 
while I share there the is a reasonably active discussion about various tools and uh, and reaction to the stories that you're telling I think there are no questions so far oh um, uh, I actually, actually wasn't looking at the comments sorry <laughs> No, no, it's it's all good. If there would be a question or anything, we would try to forward that to you in an appropriate manner. Uh, I do have like one question, but it's a little bit off topic about JMeter because I've never mastered that myself, I would say. Uh, so we, before we go into the demos, maybe uh, you can elaborate. So when when you use JMeter, right, do you create do you tend to create, like I know that this is different case by case basis, but do you tend to create the test suits that kind of sort of low test the whole scenarios of like the user workflows, like log in, add something to cart, check out, do this, that, or like more individual pages or individual REST API, like endpoints? Okay, so thank you for that question. First of all, um, what I like to test a lot or give a lot of time when, I mean, our time, we have limited resources, time for, for creating tests. And once you have your really nice pyramid of tests, you have to define which ones are you going to um, apply more effort. The ones that I prefer, I mean, there are people that are always telling me, the yeah, unit test, you have to have like 99 coverage in the yeah, unit test and like, really? Well, I'm not going to into that discussion, but I'm going to say what I prefer to do. My, my Most of the time I spend, it's going to be an integration test. And when people he listen, hear me t tell about integration tests, they tend to think about end-to-end -end tests. And no, integration test is the testing between two different components. I don't even have to test more than two components for them to be integration tests. So there are things that I like, it's separation of concerns. So if um, I have um, really good uh, tests between component A and component B, that's an integration test. And if you later on have a, a component C, and usually they interact or you should have a very delimited interaction between components. If that's a melee, like everybody integrates with every, everybody else, you have a problem in design. So that's actually not so great. So when I, what I like to do is integration test and, and the most significant relationship between two components, that's what I like to test. Now, uh, JMeter, it's great, but as I said, and all all consultants know, it's it's all depend on the what kind of functionality component A and component B, or it's it's actually uh, using. I mean, if it's going to be JMeter, is not the, for the faint of hearts. As I said, it's super powerful. It's UI. It's not the most. Mm, inviting <laughs> there is a lot of things happening there uh, what an important thing is that you can save your test plans in plain plain text at the end of the day with a specific format but you can also add it to your source code and they can be versioned um, so i your answer is depends on what are what is the functionality that I'm testing, the type of functionality that I'm testing, the type of test that I'm doing. Uh, as I said, uh, JMeter shines in low testing. I noticed that somebody mentioned Gatling. Gatling is perfect, but it doesn't run so well in parallel. For, for low testing, JMeter is the option. So yes, Gatling, I love it too. Well, no, JMeter, I love it. Gatling, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you for the for the answer. And the the thing you mentioned there were in the testing pyramid, right? You mm -hmm. you personally try to rely more on integration tests. Uh, there was I'm just immediately came to mind this blog post by uh, Spotify, but the engineering team at Spotify a few years back, where they redefined and told the story how they test microservices specifically 
and that's how the pyramid transforms into a honeycomb, right? Where the unit test testing implementation details is a small trial triangle at the bottom. The integration test is the rectangle, the base of that, the like the powerhouse of the testing, and then a little bit of end-to-end -end tests uh, at the top. I'm gonna link it somewhere, and uh, I think it's a very good additional source of info that also supports that. Uh, the idea that you were talking about. So, I mean, when I uh, when I talked about integration test, I the the example that I like to showcase is one very close to us in CERN. In CERN, turns out, remember CERN was the the uh, cloud. Uh, the um, I what's the name? Big data. Hmm? Big data. No, no big data. No, no, no. The launch L LCH. The la long Large Hadron Collider. Collider, sorry, I always pronounce that bad. But anyway, it was it was closed for close to two years because there was an explosion there. And uh, if you see and you visit the CERN, you see that their testing facilities are amazing. The only problem was that it, because the the segments of the Collaudron was, <laughs> yes, Andres just joined this room, yes. <laughs> The segments are so large that in their testing facilities, they couldn't uh, never test them in conjunction. So two years, I don't remember how many millions of dollars per day lost just because the integration test was not done properly in the CERN. So really, we test, we are good in isolation. We can focus on the details but when we start scaling, having more panoramic views is when we as human beings sometimes miss the picture. So that's why I like, I always make that effort, like in that particular suite segment. And as I said, this is not about end-to-end. -end. This is not about inviting a lot of components to the party. It's, it can only be two and that's it. Hmm. Did your experience on GraalVM help to improve test containers in any kind of way? Well, that's for you guys. I don't know. Yeah, I, I will uh, keep being, oh, uh, I'll answer that later. I need to think it a little bit through and I don't want to derail this conversation uh, right now. Uh, Ishel was trying to do, uh, to show us a demo or mm -hmm. sorts. So maybe we can proceed with that and I will think about GraalVM. To catch <laughs> yeah, that. sure, sure. Well, uh, I yes, I'm sure sharing my well browser. Before we go into the demos, yes, th th let me go really fast into this one. So since so this is a page of Wiremock, one interesting part is they they have the Wiremock lab, and I wanted to talk a little bit about that because if you are using REST APIs, one thing that you should keep in mind is Open API. Open API is the foundation for the specification. Um, the Open API initiative is part of a foundation that is under the Linux software foundation and they are creating the specification. If you are using the specification, chances are that you are working with Swagger, which provides a lot of tools for testing and documenting. And if you create your documentation in, in, in OpenAPI or with Swagger, uh, you can generate code, you can generate validators. And one of the things that I wanted to show you if you are in, in our uh, Java world is that MockLab um, supports OpenAPI. So it creates mock service out of the box. Caution, even though I always talked about open source, um, MockLab is a um, paid service but it's um, Wiremock on, as um, Wiremock in, in, in the cloud. So that was for REST API, let me continue. That was for creating your, mocking your servers. And again, REST Assure is for testing your clients. And um, one of the things, as I said, is, for example, Quarkus, I, uh, Quarkus is using RestAssure for testing their, for, for in, in their tests. 
So rest assured, it's really, really used out there. And my my most favorite part, even though Mr. Hacky, Mr. Hacky is a developer that works with Groovy a lot. I will I will send you all those links that I'm showing. And he has a really cool um, example of how to use the rest assured and Groovy, the slurpers in a very, very simple and direct way. So this is an example that he presents and it's really one of my favorite ones. Yes, Mr. Hacky is amazing. Um, so this is documentation. And as one of the things that I wanted to show you is verify the content, full content meta uh, data on, on the request and the response. And as you can see, it's super easy. That's why rest assured, as I show you, it's even used um, by Quarkus. The, well, Obviously, I already talked about test containers, and this was what I was mentioning at the end, the new support for K3S. JMeter, super fast. Um, JMeter, and this is the part that I wanted to show you, it support bean bash uh, samplers, and the JS are two to three samplers. This is when you can use Groovy and how to use it. And there are some examples out there how you can create in your sample some code to change either the request or to extract more information of the responses. So that's what I wanted to show you. Yes, the, that, yes that was the most interesting part. Now, for the examples, like the demos that I want to show you, wait me a minute because my IntelliJ disappeared for me. So give me a second. Yeah, no worries, um, no worries. While, while, while we are uh, looking for the idea, there is similar to how uh, there's a kind of a cloud service for WireMock. There are also cloud services for other interesting tools and libraries that you can use. For example, the Atomic Jar is currently working on creating Test Containers Cloud, where, which is a cloud service which you can use to run your uh, Docker containers spawned from the integration tests with Test Containers in a cloud in a serverless manner. A very interesting tool. Now uh, let me share my oh okay. Uh, Wait a second, uh, where is my book? Ah yeah, here. Well yes, this is super simple. I mean actually this this example was inspired by by one of because it's super simple. Um by inspired by one series of example that Benjamin Mushko is doing with test containers. And you should invite him next. He is an amazing speaker and he does a lot of with testing. He does a lot of with testing with, um, with test containers and most of the tools that I have talked about. And he actually supported a lot of the Gradle um, plugins uh, the, at the beginning. He actually, for the plugins he was supporting for Docker Compose, if you go into that documentation at that time, we well, he was building the plugins and he said, well, I'm not going to support this because you shouldn't follow this actual path. You should move directly into using test containers. I mean, if you're still just using like Docker Compose with the Gradle plugin, then maybe you should have a look to that. So. Please do invite a Benjamin. Benjamin is one of my Noted. idols in Noted. this industry. <laughs> yes. Noted. We'd love to have Benjamin. Benjamin, if you're watching, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll ping you and let's, let's talk. Yes. Yes. So this actually test, it's the most simple test that you can find for Postgres. One thing, if you are using me, you like me have the new Apple uh, chip you would have noticed that there are some issues with some containers. So if you haven't noticed, see yourself in myself, which is now 
jumping through hoops sometimes to use uh, some containers because they are not supported here. There is a solution there. I'm actually using a virtual um, kind of virtual box inside it to support different ones. For example, one that you don't have any problems and it's out of the box is, the, for example, the Postgres container. The MySQL container does have issues. But anyway, what I wanted to show you here is I have an implementation of adding an item inside the database and, and, and extracting it. Um, yes, we totally need more support for the M1 chip, for sure. Uh, other programming languages are doing great. Java, not so great. So that's a shame. We should push more into that direction. But what I wanted to show you, it's something that's really interesting for me. Um, when you run, let me run this one. And let's hope actually that this is working right now. Oh, no, perfect. And... Uh, Docker client. Oh, it's because I'm not running my Docker client. Let me run that. Yeah, that's so, a common. Yes, yeah. For people that are using the M1 machine, as I said, there are some um, decisions that they have to make because if you run the Docker, the Docker desktop for your Mac, you will be trading the, the um, easy of running your test containers from here, but not being able to run all test containers because of the support of the architecture. But anyway, so now I'm running my desktop client. Yes, that would be nice. Hmm. And sadly, I cannot. Um, well, one of the things that I don't know, sometimes people miss that part is that you can increase the log. And this is something that I usually use in all my containers because you get all the logs of your container here. What happens if you remove this one? It will only tell you if it's happening or not. If I were to show you right now my Docker uh, desktop and show you the images that I have, if for once I will remove, remove a specific, let me, let me share that, my entire screen. Sorry for making you do so many things, Ole. Now I'm, I hope it, it can, you can still see something. No, it's huge, my desk. Okay. Well, believe me when I say, if you're seeing my Docker desktop and I can show you what are the images that I have locally inside my Docker, here you can see that I have, oh, well, I have tests with the Oracle XE made by the image made by Gerald. It runs really fast with Postgres. So if I remove my, my, my image from there and run again my test, you will see, you will see that it will actually try to download again. Uh, I will have it in my image and then, yes, so there. And now if I go to my test containers, you will see that I have several, well, I had uh, two containers running at that time. And the one that it's there, it was Ryuk. And Ryuk stays later on because as I said, he takes care of um, disposing of both your resources after the test has run. Did you know that Rook Docker image has been downloaded more than 50 million times? Like Congrats. that's quite yeah. a bit of a respectable number of times. Uh, Ishel, would you, since you were showing some tests and talking about M1 and challenges of running Docker, would you be willing to run a quick experiment? Uh, sure. I would love to onboard you into <laughs> Uh, trying out uh, Test Containers Cloud. Okay. If you're, w if you're willing to try that, uh, 
there is a in the private chat here there is an invite link that I don't want to spoil currently, but if you can click on it, yes, uh, and it opens a page where you can log in with your GitHub account. So if you yes, can click sure. on that uh, and authorize the app, I just want mm -hmm. to make sure that there is no uh, this this long URL with the with the invite invitation code is not longer in the browser. No, so, it's no longer in the browser. <laughs> Very, very good. Mm -hmm. Can you switch back the tab to the comments instead of private chat, not to leak that as well? And then we're going to add your screen back to the thing. Actually, yeah, let me add only the, 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 well. Oh, no, but you're going to be running the, you're going to okay. be running the test containers tests. So uh, the okay. full screen okay. is fine. It's just, uh, let's not leak the URL. Nope. There is this. I already have download for version one, two, three. Yeah, yeah. Do you want uh, to do that? Can you? Like from your screen where you have the stream yard, can you make mm -hmm. sure that you are not showing the private chat tab, but instead showing no, no, the no. comments? It's not. It's okay. only the comments. I... Yes. Okay. We're safe. Okay. I'm I'm adding back to the stream. Let's go. Right. So you have access now to Task Containers Cloud. And this is this app, web app where you can download uh, the client. So mm -hmm. if you click the download. It will pull down a very small and uh, lightweight Test Containers Cloud client desktop application, which you need to install. This is a like sort of a, a user space application. It doesn't require any privileges, so you just drag it into the application folder, so, and then you um, need to run it. Yes, here it is. Right, you click open. Uh -huh. What it does here now. It is one of my favorite things. What? It's a different browser. Can you log in here? Yes, don't worry. We can do something even better. No, I think that's a, oh, maybe, okay. It's an, uh, there is a little OAuth authentication. So it tries to talk to the same app. Uh, and now you have Test Containers Cloud configured. You can see in the taskbar, you have a colorful icon for the Test Containers Cloud. And if you click on it. Yes, uh, here. Does it say running? Does it say yes. running? Yes. It is running. So let's make sure that our Test Containers Java dependency is uh, one of the recent versions. For example, you can try uh, to update that to 116.3. Yes, it is, my dear. Right. <laughs> Excellent. Can you full screen the IDE or make it a little bit larger? Uh, Let me add the size. Uh, yeah, that'd be that'd be excellent. Yeah. For you. Uh, wait me a second. Command scroll. Command scroll. Command scroll. It's not working for me. Oh, sorry. You can also do the sh on the touchpad. Like yeah. Sh yeah. Let me Maybe. See. No. <laughs> the jet, the jet brain folks are. <laughs> yeah, so no, it's because we, let me let me say so view. There are, at, there are at least four Java champions on the call here, and, um, and nobody can can do this view. Yes, you can do a, enter presentation mode maybe or something like this. Right. Oh my goodness! Presentation appearance no window presentation no ah uh, ah. Uh. Enter presentation mode. Yeah. Yes. This Perfect. should be much, much better. Right. So we have the latest version of test containers. Uh, mm -hmm. You can also, uh, if you will, you can stop the do local Docker client. You don't okay. have to, and the test containers tests can distinguish and use test containers cloud if it is configured. But for the cleanliness of the experiment, you can stop the local Docker as well because the tests will not use it. Uh, yeah, wait just... a second now well, because now I lost in my okay. Uh, yeah, oh, this is exciting. It, yeah, also, no. if anyone is watching, this is completely non scripted, so you can you can see how non scripted it is. It's yes, totally and horribly, horribly. <laughs> no, it's good, yeah, it's, no. go it's, it's going swell, it's absolutely excellent. So now there is no local Docker running, and we still nope. can run our integration test container based tests. 
uh, from our ID or from our command line. So you just rerun the test and let's see whether it works and how it works. Yeah. Run. Yep. Let's run it. Let's see the moment of truth. So one immediate thing that you will notice is that uh, the, the, in the log output, the Docker client uh, has connected to the Docker server and it says connected to Docker and it says that it connected to Test Containers Cloud. So during the installation process, the, uh, there was a configuration file with a token written and now the Test Containers tests determine that they need to connect to the Test Containers Cloud. And now your test is, is your test still running? Yes, yeah, it's still running. I remember it's super, yeah, because I'm, I'm executing the database script. Right. And it's green. Yeah, and it's green. You can also rerun that because uh, this first time, obviously it had to pull the Postgres image. Uh, yes, yeah, so directly. Requiring. So yeah. if you rerun this, uh, we can get a little bit closer to the real feel, how it feels uh, for the user experience. Well, it wasn't that bad. I mean, it wasn't that uh, slow um, to test. No, it wasn't slow at all. It's just no. one reason why it's not slow, because while well, pulling images, which the, the, the hub is somewhere in the cloud, pulling them to a cloud VM is very, very efficient, right? So. It ran, it ran your test uh, without the dependency on the local Docker installed. Congratulations, yeah, you run your first test with Test Containers Cloud. Uh, perfect. One uh, of the benefits, one of the benefits here, uh, specifically for you and other people in the same, with the same setup is that in the cloud, you can run whichever images because you can run the uh, AMD based architecture for the Docker, right? So now your actual application environment where you run the tests and the Docker environment where you run uh, the Docker containers are decoupled. So mm -hmm. you can, you can, you can, you can run this. Uh, right. And as, as, as Sergey mentions in the chat, this wasn't <laughs> scripted. Uh, and yeah, but it, it all worked out. It all worked out. It all worked this out. Is, yes. Yeah. I, I had faith in our product and it's currently, <laughs> so there are a number of advantages to this, right? And one of them is that now on your M1, you can run all kinds of tests with test containers. Uh, no, actually I'm going to test it right now. Well, you can, you can talk uh, because I yeah. had another test that we, wh where I explain you exactly this. My M1 machine is having problem with a specific version of, of the of one of my Docker images. So I have to run through so many loops. And yeah. my solution number one is it shall do all these loops or go back to the, your old machine. But now what you're telling me is that I can test right now that test that was failing in my Docker, my local yeah. Docker, yeah. because yeah. of the architecture is a mismatch. So yeah. you actually yeah. have returned my happiness to work with yes. this container so, even on M1. Yeah, you can test it right now. There are a number of things that you, like not a number of things, there are a few things. Look, so check that the test contains Java dependencies like at the latest versions, right? Yes. And and there are also like, you can, you can do things with the cloud that uh, would not work easily, right? For example, map volumes and stuff like that. But for like normal test containers based tests should work out of the box. Uh, we did one of the streams with uh, Josh Long before, right? And uh -huh. he was showing us examples of MongoDB. And I think MongoDB didn't work very well on the M1 then. Uh, and, and for him, the cloud offer and the cloud worked very, very well. No, it's, it's because you don't have an idea how many uh, Docker images are having problems with this particular machine. Like oh, right I know. now. I know. We, uh, we're in the middle of like annoying. <laughs> yes, Sorry. I know. Actually, so this is this is one of the one of the things that uh, 
Sergey said as the uh, Sergey is the CEO of Atomic Jar, right? On and one of the task centers Java maintainers uh, and a brilliant engineer. And that was the problem for him as well. And that was one of the reasons that he thought that this cloud solution would would have legs and never looked back. And yeah, we do have an excellent engineering team here. Uh, yeah, so Ishal, if you're waiting. Thank you very much. Yes. I'm not sure whether we are supposed to look at your screen or not. So for just. No, 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 no. I, yeah, I will only the... run it. Yes, I yeah, will yeah. only run, just run it, it and tell it's, you. It's not live. I... It's not live. No worries. No worries. No worries. It just, uh, it was removed from the stream all the time. So uh, there are no leaks. But we have an audience. Uh, yes. We, no, are, we are all um, are very yeah. interested in, in checking whether the test would work or not. Right. Oh, this was a the great demo. I, I hope the test will work. Yeah, uh, no, I will tell you and I will push it. I will, I will, if, if it's because it's, we are already on time, but I will let you know. And honestly, on, honestly, I, I mean, this is me saying I was annoyed. I spent a lot of time trying to make this test run in my new machine and I was annoyed at that point. So if this actually works, it, you reduce my level of annoyance to almost zero. <laughs> which is oh, that's, a uh, wound from me. That's the best feedback. Now we just need to need to figure out how it works and 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 this, right? Yeah, but that's 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 one of the most common feedbacks that we hear from people who do get access to Test Contrast Cloud is that they don't like all the problems with architecture mismatch is completely are completely eliminated because of this decoupling. Which is yeah. you can run your tests on Raspberry Pi if you wish, right? Because for the actual like Java part, a Java process part is not very resource intensive as well, right? But it, if you, if your application spins up even at like a few Docker containers with a database or something, then it becomes kind of heavy for the Raspberry Pi. <laughs> but again, with decoupling, there are plenty of resources in the cloud, right? It, mm -hmm. The infinite scale, and you can run. You can run the test anywhere the same way in development, in CI, with confidence. Actually, it didn't work, but it went further than now. It's a, I know that it's a problem, with, but it actually made sense. Like now I can connect to, to the container. The container was properly initialized and everything was, it was my init script. I was doing something right. else, but then okay. I'm, I'm completely solved because this is already, the container is already running and I don't have our problems with my architecture yeah. of my, my yeah. machine. Yeah, yeah, you're like, I've seen this a tweet <laughs> with a picture where like one of the happiest moments of the, of the, in the life of a developer is when like, yes, success, I'm seeing a different error message, yes. right? This is progress. <laughs> So, yeah, the, yeah, this is this error. I know how to fix it. The other one yeah. was like, oh my goodness, there is, you know, that's the problem when you cannot do anything. I uh, when you're depending on an architecture or something that it's not supported or a known problem, and there is no workaround of the workaround, it's super difficult. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love containers. I, I they are very useful, but right now we are in exact sweet moment where there's a lot of issues to be fixed. So if we, as I said, we have the right tools to reduce the impedance between different, uh, in our daily work, then I'm sold. This is a tool that helps me. Oh, that is a wonderful feedback. Thank you very much. Uh, and then thank you very much for the whole session. It was a, a very lovely overview of uh, libraries and tools. And I think we all can agree that they are all very useful in testing specifically for the microservices, which everyone nowadays is, almost everyone is doing. So thank you for the, that. I think, hope it was very educational. And uh, for everyone watching, like and subscribe. Find Ishel on social networks. The, the, there is in the description below, uh, there is the addresses. You can follow her. You can ask her questions that you didn't get time to ask now. And see you next time. I'm going to end the broadcast. Thank you very much.